Um, first of all, I'm going to say um, we have um, an exit in the back. So, you know, if you guys would exit through the back, not the front, because we are, we are filming this, you know, on, on YouTube. So um, I, would, I would appreciate that. But um, anyways, welcome everybody to the 2024 PRB Bible Conference with my good friend and our pastor, Pastor Rick Cortez. Yeah. Um, of course, respect for the Word of God is concentrating on the Word of God, so you don't want to be a distraction to anybody. If you have to get up, usually I say try to sit in the back if you have to get up and sneak out the back door. But uh, you know, as I look out here, you know, all these faces, um, I can see that most of you are familiar with this. Um, there may be one or two that's not. But respect for the Word of God is concentrating on the Word of God. So if you're self, make sure your cell phones are off, you know, and uh, try not to talk if you could, um, and things of that nature. So, because, you, you know, there are serious people here that want to learn the Word of God, and it's hard to concentrate, you know, when, uh, when people are talking or moving around. So I appreciate that. All right, without further ado, ask the Rick Tess. Oh, okay, yes, we do have books in the back. Okay, um, so you're free to get them. Of course, uh, wait till after class. You don't want to do what class is going are doing. We do have a, a offering box. Um, of course, um, it's it's a grace ministry, so you're not forced to give. But if you feel you know you you, you want to give, the box will be there, um, and I'll probably mention it on Sunday too, as we do an offering. I'll probably do an offering. So um, yeah, that's you can put you can put your offering there. It's a great, like I said, it's a grace ministry, so. Give graciously as you as you as you feel or you're motivated to give. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, Deacon Jim. Let's see if I can get this thing hooked up on my belt, and we'll be ready to rock and roll. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 A couple of faces I haven't seen in a while, and then we've got some other faces that kind of kept in touch with me the other day. I'm like, I think we're gonna make it. I said, All right. I'm going to do my best to get it online. So, give me, a, give me a minute here, folks. That's not happening. It's going in the pocket. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. We are good. We are live. Okay. Well, actually, not live. I'm recording and then. I tell people all the time when I do a Bible conference, I record everything and hopefully I can get it all up. I pay extra for all the iCloud space. Hey, Bobby, I just see you over there, buddy. I just see you crept in on me. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I do my best to get them all up. And so far, the conferences I've done, I've been able to get all of it up. So, um, you know, I encourage people, come, have the face-to-face -face teaching, take a vacation, take a long weekend off, come to a conference, socialize, and get the fellowship in like we did last night. We had a fellowship dinner last night. I'm sure we'll have some things happening later on tonight and tomorrow or whatever. So it's good to come to a conference, but I do try to get them up, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time. If only one or two videos get up, it's technical, and it's above my pay grade. So um, that's why I got my guy Rob over here who's been helping me out. Um, I would like to give a round of applause to Trista and Ty Lee for all the hard work. When you take on a conference, and I told Chad and Jessica to this when they did the South Dakota, by the way, they sent me an email, they did want to come. They were, I don't think they're going to be rolling in this weekend, but they did want to be here. Um, you're taking on a little ministry. I taught this during the Titus. South Dakota Conference, if you guys were with me and you watched that conference, I was talking about leadership and how Titus was a good example of leadership and, and, and the Apostle Paul could trust Titus in different situations. And that booklet, Titus, I'm going to start working on after this conference. So that'll be the next book to come out, hopefully by 2025. Um, I've got all the notes from the conference. But you're taking on a little ministry for four or five months. You ladies know that. it's And that's we all have ministries. My ministry is to do what I'm doing right now. Sometimes a ministry, God gives you a little ministry, and it might be a Bible study in your living room. It might be helping the vets down at the VA, and it's only for a period of time. But grab those times and God gives you a ministry and, and, and go for it. 
Like, step out and go for it. We're going to talk about that a little bit in this weekend as well, but I've mentioned it before. Feel free to try and reach out to me and say, Pastor, I might want to do a conference, or I might want to do this or that. Send me the email. I'll work with you. If it's about funds, we can work together. If it's about uh, location, we can work on that for a team. So I suggest uh, going forward, if you've ever been thinking about doing something like this, let me know. Or talk to Trista and Ty Lee. They're experts now. Look at this. Awesome. Uh, my wife, I'd like a round of applause. I'm nothing without her. <laughs> We're going to keep my buddy Pete in prayer. You know he had a medical condition. He had to cancel uh, being here. Uh, so unfortunately that happened to Pete. We'll keep Pete in prayer. I want to keep Pastor Jason up in New England in prayer. He's got a small Bible group going up there in the, in the, the uh, New England area where I'm from, original Grace Bible Church, Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries. And they're doing a home study. So I, I'd like to see that expand, and I'll go up there and do a conference with him. So, um, And forgive me if i got the throat lozenges going on. I'm a little bit phlegmy, as always. I've got issues with sinuses and throat. So we'll get through it. I think that's it. I think we need to do the most important thing we need to do. Get into the Word filled with the Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father. Full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word. So that by it, you may grow in respect to your salvation. Let us prepare to take in the Word of God. In doing so, I always read from the Apostle John. First John 1, 8, 9, and 10, as a reminder, the filling power of the Spirit, we get that Christ-like nature. The filling power of the Spirit opens up that Christ-like nature, and it's very simple. 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, believer, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness, sins you've forgotten about or didn't know about. 1 John 1 10, believer, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not abiding in us. Take a moment of silent prayer. Ensure our fellowship is in order. Get ready to do the most important thing we do. Get into the word filled with the spirit. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word, and we're asking for your hand to be on this Bible conference going forward, that we can glean all the little gems in your word and take them out and apply them in our life, Father. So we're praying for this Bible conference, we're praying for the word to go out into this lost and dying world on all the platforms that these videos go on, and that these people here today are blessed by your word and go out and stand strong, Father, in this lost and dying world. We're praying for these things through your son's precious name. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 2024 PRB Ministry Bible Conference. Let me get my flow going. We must obey God rather than men. This is where I've been led. The folks that are with me regularly know that I've been in the letters to Thessalonica. And those are tough letters. Um, a lot of eschatology. A lot of eschatology. And a lot of it was directed at folks that were thinking they were already heading into tribulation, they were confused about the second advent, and Paul had to go back in there. He actually sent Timothy in a second time behind him, and then he had to come back in another time and say, hey guys, let's get it together. You're, you're, you're a little bit lost in your eschatology. These events need to happen in this way. And because of that study we're in and the climate we have today in America and things going on, I felt very strongly led to teach this, and this kept being pressed on my heart. We must obey God rather than men. So there may, may be no greater time than our current day today for Christians to begin to finally realize the battle we are called to fight requires not only deep doctrinal knowledge and maturity, but also a certain finesse, calm assurance in all the approaches to life circumstances. And that calm assurance and that finesse, you're not going to get it in the cosmic system. You're not going to get it from your flesh. Because the attacks are not going to stop. This is where rapidly, like I, I keep telling people, I use the term, the beast system itself feels like it's being built around us. It really does. Whether it's 20 years from now or five years from now, that tribulation will open up. The rapture will happen. These things will happen. We don't know when. 
but we get a feeling that it, this beast system is being built, it's being constructed all around us. So there may be no greater time than today to talk about these things and look at these things. A certain finesse, a certain calm assurance in all these approaches in life. And by that, I mean family life. I mean your social life, social interaction, certainly any type of authority-driven environment we find ourselves in. And we're gonna be looking at authority in the right context because something like this can be taken out of context by far right, listen, far left or far right is not good on any scale. Far right extremists that want to rebel against everything. There's a right way to stand against wicked leadership and there's a right way to stand against those who attack you and there's a wrong way. But there are plenty of authority driven environments we find ourselves in every day. The truth be told, every environment, every day, as human authority and establishment authority we need to live in. We find it all around us. There's authority in this building. We have to follow the rules here. There's managers and, and people that are in charge. So there's authority in everywhere we go. A chain of command exists in so many of our day-to-day -day situations in life. Just driving your car down the road, I think we have a gentleman over here who will understand this. Just driving your car down the road, any street, we have laws and regulations that are enforced by police officers. That it, that's a system of authority that needs to be respected. He has to walk a line of not going overboard and being too aggressive, but by the same token, he has to be an authority figure. When you go to work, even if you're self-employed, you actually work for the customer. You work, I'm, I'm actually working for you in a sense. Yes, you're the pastor, yes, you're the leader, but I'm trying to do my job to feed the flock. So there are levels of chains of command and authority. When you go to work, even if you're self-employed, it's a misconception. A lot of people say, I want to run my own business. Well, that's, it's, it's a lot harder than you think it is. You are actually under the authority of your customer to some level. That's who you're there to please. So even if you go to work as self-employed, you answer to the authority of your customers, the family unit. The family unit has parents in authority, and the marriage, in true Christian authority, has the husband at the top of the chain of command. And that's not to get the ladies upset, that's just a reality in the Word of God. The family unit has parents and authority. The marriage is true Christian in true Christianity, not by the world's standards. <laughs> true Christianity has the husband at the top of the chain of command. The believer is called to be an authority over their own soul. God gives you freedom and free will, but we ultimately answer to him. The soul is designed to respond, respond appropriately to the word of God. There's a chain of command within your very soul structure, believer. You should always recognize this. I got to get my, my flow going with my slides here. 1 Corinthians 11.3, the Apostle Paul, <laughs> Ephesians 5.23 as well. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. And the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. Ultimate authority. There's a chain of command everywhere we go. Ephesians 5.23 tells us this as well. God is our ultimate authority. If you're a Christian, and you should be if you're here today, I would hope if you're not, well, we're going to have an altar call later on, and maybe you will become one. But that's your authority, the Word of God. And truth, as I always say, and I don't know if I'm the one that coined it in recent years, but truth is singular. So if the Bible is truth, the Word of God, the mind of Christ, Bible doctrine is truth, it's singular. That's what truth is. Everything else is slightly skewed or really vastly skewed outside of this. He has designated the doctrine of authority. It's a real doctrine. It's in Scripture. It's not hard to find. Many of you are well-schooled. You come from people like Colonel R.B. Theme Jr., Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries, where I came from, you understand these things. God has designated the doctrine of authority. When that authority and chain of command is interrupted or undermined, misery and discipline eventually follow. Usually in that order. Some form of self-induced misery and then some form of discipline. When the authority and the chain of command is interrupted, it's one of the reasons we have a lot of problems uh, in, in, in the world today, in our school systems with young people, folks as well. When the authority and chain of command is interrupted or undermined, misery and discipline eventually follow. Every time we allow the old sin nature to take control 
And we make those decisions, folks. God gave us our first divine establishment is our freedom of thought, our free will. Every time we allow the old sin nature to take control, we buck against divine authority. You have to come to a realization of that. Every time the old sin nature takes control, you're bucking against divine authority. We attempt to break that chain of command. We attempt to break that chain of command. God is ultimately always in control. But let us open up today in Acts chapter 4, royal family. Go to Acts chapter 4. And we are going to look at some things about authority. Because like I said, I feel very strongly that there, the Christians are either on one side of the fence or the other. Either they want to lay down and be a welcome mat and they don't know how to stand strong in what they believe. Or they want to like, well, we're Christians and we're going to rebel and overthrow everything. Both of those are wrong. There is a happy medium. And I hope we reach it this weekend in these lessons that God the Holy Spirit has led us on. So we're going to open in Acts chapter 4. God and his word have to be the priority in the Christian way of life. There's no other. It's very simple, but there's no other avenue, folks. God and his word have to be the authority in the Christian way of life. Otherwise, every authority-driven situation or chain of command we face, and I just mentioned we have them every day. You might not recognize them. We have them every day. Will lack true integrity and also stability of your soul. It's going to throw you into chaos. Authority has to be upheld, yet corrupt or evil authority can lead a believer into not only sin, but physical danger. You're going to see examples of exactly this, what I'm telling you. Authority has to be upheld, yet corrupt or evil authority can lead a believer into not only sin, but physical danger. Rebellion or aggressive solutions are simply not the answer. It's not the answer. Rebellion and aggressive solutions are not the answer. There is a time and place to stand against wicked leadership. And when you make a stand on something, all you are saying is, I'm not going any further in this area. I don't agree with this. I'm going to stick with what God is telling me. And you have to realize, and you're going to find out this weekend, that you have to be mature enough to say, I know there's going to be a consequence behind this. So if I stand firm in something, there's going to be a consequence behind this. But rebellion or aggressive solutions are not the answer. There is a time and place to stand against wicked leadership, and it can only come from divine discernment. Our discernment. Levels of maturity are going to help your discernment. So you have to have the Word of God. You have to have the mind of Christ. You have to have Bible doctrine. You want to get to a place where when you walk into a situation, you have that, and I think the, uh, the, the words of uh, the Colorado kid, Cliff Spears, years ago, we were one time behind the pulpit in Grace Bible Church, to step back and take a breath. Before you emote, before you jump on something, take, back and st take, take that step back, take a breath, and stand there and think about, okay, what's the situation going? Let me evaluate, let me discern with my doctrinal lens, not my human viewpoint, how to handle this situation before I rattle off at the mouth or before I make an action that I can't take back. We do and say things oftentimes that we can't take back. Words, the Word of God tells us that tongue is a fire and words are like arrows. You can't pull them back. You can't pull them back. But even within our own circle of family and friends as well as people we interact with at work and in our community, we need to be prepared to operate in real integrity and stability of mind. How many times, I, I guarantee everybody in the, in, would raise their hand if I asked this question, how many times have you been in interaction at work or your circle of family and friends, not even necessarily with an authority figure, that you walked away and realized, I just handled that situation poorly. I said the wrong thing, I snapped off. This, I went too far in that direction. I'm a, I'm a king at that. I was really good at that back in the day. I've learned. I've gotten a lot humbler. I tell people all the time, I'm 5'8 now. I used to be 6'8. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm clueless. I saw the Nephilim coming off the elevator this morning. So I used to be like that. In my own arrogance. But even within our own circle of family and friends, as well as people we interact with, work and community, we need to be prepared and operate in real integrity, stability of mind. Step back, take a breath, relax. Am I in the Word of God? Am I in the new nature? Because unjust treatment and personal attacks will occur. Unjust treatment and personal attacks will occur in the devil's world. It's the world we live in. Hostile environments, 
abrasive people, difficult situations are not going to disappear. You can't just hide out with a group of Christians somewhere and sit there, well, I'm going to wait for the rapture. I'm not going to do anything. Hostile environments, abrasive people, attacks, difficult situations are not going to disappear just because you are a Christian. In fact, because you are a Christian, not the words of Pastor Rick, they will increase. They will increase. John 15, 18, if the world hates you, our Lord says, you know that it has hated me before it has hated you, believer. Matthew 24, 9, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations because of who? My name, if you're truly walking as a Christian, as a believer, applying his word, reflecting Christ in your life, will increase into the time of the rapture. I believe all of these things will be just birth pains that are coming forward will increase through the time of the rapture. So we need to be prepared. How are we going to deal with these things? We'll pick up a rifle and fight. Well, listen, self-defense is in the Bible, absolutely. But it's a rare occasion. You better handle it the right way. Right thing done in the right way. We all know that. The right thing done in the right way. Jesus never made a promise that once you are in union with him, the cosmic system attacks will stop. I don't preach that gospel. Name it and claim it and everything's going to be a bed of roses. And if you're sick, that's because you're a bad boy or a bad girl. If you had a good day, it's because you're a good boy or a good girl. We have to be careful of all that. That's just emotions tickling. That's just your flesh. Jesus never made a promise that once you are in union with him, the cosmic system will stop attacking you because Jesus Christ, you are in union. And they recognize it. They won't. In fact, they may realize the demons behind the scenes, and that's a reality, and the fallen angels behind the scenes and Satan's system will realize this is somebody applying the word of God. We've got to get some stumbling blocks in front of that one. We've got to frustrate that one. Maybe you've passed a few tests in your walk with God. Maybe we all have. I don't know. The best and truly only way to deal with these types of people, these types of environments, has to come from God's word, <clears throat> excuse me, being applied in your life. There's a difference between what you're doing right now, absorbing, hopefully digesting, metabolizing, lots of words we can use. There's a difference between doing that and then going out and applying it. The applying it gets tough. We all fumble in the application stage, but that's why you want to have that gnosis turning into epinosis because that's applied wisdom. You can use it now. Your Christ-like nature is what you want to shine forward. Don't we want that in every situation? You're Christ like to walk away from a situation and say, I think Christ shined in my life. Not walk away saying, no, I think I handled that one the wrong way. And you have to rebound on your way back to the car or on your break. Your Christ like nature is what you want to shine forward. That is the only nature able to handle these situations. Trust me when I tell you. That is the only nature able to handle these situations while simultaneously offering these hostile and lost world that we are in, a glimpse of the grace of God. That's what you're doing. Even when you walk away and it looks like you're a loser to the world, sometimes you just reflected Christ and you glorify God. Allowing the person or work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to shine in a lost and dying world is very important. That's being a true ambassador. We're all called to be ambassadors. We're called to be soldiers, believer priests. We're called to something. It's up to you whether you want to apply it or not after salvation. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, matter of fact, as though God were what? Making an appeal through us, an application, an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Ephesians 6.20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, the Apostle Paul, very comfortable with being in chains. And he always said that. I'm an ambassador. I'm here for Christ. I'm not worried about what the world is doing to me. Which I'm an ambassador in change that in proclaiming it may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Even in the worst circumstance, in a prison situation, and Paul was familiar with that, the Apostle Paul recognized he represented who? The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul was never, oh, I'm stuck in prison. What am I going to do? Paul's here too. I'm in chains for Christ. I'm here for Christ. Even when he went out of 
the zone, what we would call the environment that God wanted him to be, and he failed and he got a little disciplined and maybe got locked up and delayed in certain situations. Paul failed. He still turned the curse into a blessing. You know how to do that. Bible thumping and bitter attitudes that simply fight back in the same rude or aggressive fashion give a terrible example of the Christian way of life. I can think back you know, 15 years ago in situations when I spoke to people and I thought I was showing my, how smart I was, how doctrinal I was, and I was Bible thumping and being bitter, and I walked away from it. I, I taught them. You didn't teach them anything. I didn't teach them anything. They didn't come to Christ. They just said, there goes a Christian, making me feel guilty and shamed. We have to find that finesse and that calm assurance. Bible thumping, bitter attitudes simply fight back in the same rude, aggressive fashion. Give a terrible example of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This Bible conference, I want to show you solid examples of walking in and applying truth in more difficult circumstances of this temporal walk. We're in a temporal walk here. You can't hide it. You can't hide away from it. We're in a temporal walk here that's far from perfect. It's called an angelic conflict. Call it what you want. Spiritual warfare. So I'm hoping I want to show you solid examples of what I'm talking about. Walking and applying truth in more difficult examples and circumstances of this temporal life. Now you're looking at John and Peter here, mostly what they're talking about here. And some of the apostles have been doing exactly what the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ ordained them to do. First and foremost, they're not outside the plan of God. They're inside the plan of God and they're going to get attacked by wicked leadership. Inside the plan of God. To speak the truth. It's what he ordained them to do. Teach the gospel to a lost and dying world. It's what he ordained them to do. To use the temporary gift of healing to establish the early formation of the church. Let me say that again. To establish the early formation of the church. Temporary gift of healing. Temporary gift. They were following God's plan. They weren't outside of it. Following God's plan. Not human plans. Not emotions or religious nonsense. They were not trying to lead a rebellion. You're not going to see that. They were not trying to lead a rebellion, nor were they promoting Christian activism in the streets. You have to be careful with all of this stuff. You start and end up doing deeds of your flesh and works. They were not trying to lead a rebellion against authority. They weren't promoting Christian activism out in the streets to get everybody's attention. Acts 4.1, pick it up there in Acts 4.1. As they were speaking to the people, doing what God ordained them to do, the priests and the captain of the temple of the guard and the Sadducees came up to them. And the Greek present tense here tells us they had been teaching to keep continuing to speak, to really keep teaching, to answer questions about the person and work of Jesus Christ, what they were called to do. This is what they were going to keep doing. This is what they had been doing. There was absolutely nothing criminal here. This is not a rebellion. There's nothing they were doing that resembles rebellion. Acts 4.2, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching, greatly disturbed because they were teaching the pe to the people and proclaiming Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. They kept on having, present tense, pain and misery and great discomfort and grieving and frustration over the teaching and truth of Jesus Christ. The octodeomai is the Greek word you're looking at. It speaks to a deep mental anguish. They're having a deep mental anguish. Do you realize there are people, we see it in our world, that have a deep mental anguish when you speak truth? You bring up the gospel of Jesus Christ or you use some type of biblical principle to solve a problem and they're an unbeliever or maybe even a lost believer that, that isn't being taught the right way. They get a deep mental anguish, frustration. They feel insulted. It actually pierces and pokes them. The truth of Christ, the truth of Bible doctrine. The odeomai speaks to a deep mental anguish or frustration who feel insulted or pain. They came up to them. It wasn't like John and, and Peter were trying to run over to the Sadducees and Pharisees and say, hey, listen to me. They were just doing what God ordained them to do, what Jesus Christ told them to do. These guys are coming upon them with frustration, feeling insulted, feeling pain, like somebody was picking a fight with them. Do you realize 
what you are doing here today, right now, causes some people great frustration and anger. And here in America I'm talking about, not just any other pockets across the world where people scoff at Christianity. Do you realize what you're doing here today, just sitting, studying the Bible, wanting to get more enriched into the mind of Christ, it frustrates and angers some people. It makes them angry to, think, to find you that you're here. We even have people within our own circle of family and friends that might say, no, you went to one of those Bible conferences? You going to Bible class again? The Sadducees, who were the wealthy and connected political class, they despised and disagreed with belief in resurrection. That's what really kind of stuck them. Really, any teaching on afterlife upset them. The resurrection was really kind of a thorn in their side. The fact that they were teaching on Jesus Christ and his resurrection was too much for them to bear. Truth for some people is too much for them to bear. Truth is too much for some people to bear. Acts 4, 3, and they laid hands on them, physical, put them in prison until the next day, for it was already evening. Acts 4, 4. But many of those who had heard the message believed. They got the job done. And the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now, many of you know, and if you don't, in the ancient world, women and children were often not counted in these types of historical accounts. So if you see a number like that, there were 5,000 people or 5,000 men standing there, becoming born again and saved, listening to a message, that number could be doubled. We simply don't know. This number was probably much greater because in the ancient world, no insult to ladies or children. They just weren't counted that way. It just wasn't done that way. You have to understand the historical context you're looking at. The apostles Peter and John were leading an incredible number of people to the Lord. This was just one event, when you think about it. There's several they were involved in. This is just one event. You see, when the believer is centered inside God's plan, they're walking inside, they're doing the best they can. We all fail and fumble. We're not perfect. But when you're centered inside God's plan, you're a serious student of the word, you're moving forward. When the believer is centered inside God's plan, they are not focused on personal or political agendas. We all have to be careful with this. This is the climate we're in nowadays as well. It's one of the reasons I think God, the Holy Spirit, wanted this message to get out there. This is the climate we're in. When the believer is centered inside God's plan, they are not focused on personal or political agendas. They are pressing forward with confidence in Him. They are pressing forward with confidence on exactly the pathway God has put them on. That's what the apostles would do. They were certain we're on the right path. We're doing the right thing. The filling power of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Word. We talk about the two power options, folks. There is nothing more important in your toolbox, in your six-pack, in your, your, your shooter, whatever you want to call it, your weapon, than the two power options. The filling power of the Spirit and the Word. It's your guide. It's your compass. It's your engine driving the believer. Being filled with the Spirit, being in the Word habitually. This will almost certainly ensure opposition and attacks at different points. If you're being filled with the Spirit habitually, in your circle and family and friends environments you get in, you're predominantly filled with the Spirit. Not all the time, but most of the time. And you're starting to have the word circulate and mean something in your life. It's gnosis turning into epignosis. I can guarantee you there's going to be attacks and opposition. And sometimes it comes from those that claim they care about us or they're, they're friends with us or they're family members. This will almost certainly ensure opposition and attacks at different points. You're looking at it right here, examples of the apostles. There are literally places in this world that teaching the gospel of Christ can get you jailed or even killed. How crazy is that? It seems like, to me, in, in my lifetime, it's become more and more fashionable to make fun of Christians in Christ than it is of any other belief system. And it seems like every other belief system is more and more protected. And these are things we got to expect. We don't get freaked out. It's actually, I think Jimmy and I were talking about this and some other folks as well. There's a comfort in that. Even seeing some of the nonsense and chaos in the world and different things happening, you start realizing the Bible's unfolding around you. There's a comfort in that because you know you're in the right. You know you're with the Lord. You know you're heading in the right direction. There are literally places in this world, though, that teaching the gospel of Christ could get you jailed or killed. 
kilt, as my, my French Canadian Pepe used to say, get your kilt. Don't run across the street to get kilt. <laughs> Throw me down the stairs my hat, will you? That's a, that's a French Canadian thing too as well. If Bible doctrine is your foundation and problem solving device, they are in there. You will not only expect this, you will endure it. If Bible doctrine is your foundation and your problem solving devices are found in the word of God, we know about these. You will not only expect this from time to time, you're not in shock and awe. You're going to be able to endure it. You're going to be able to endure it. Even when the attacks or stumbling blocks comes directly from Satan, folks, it was allowed by God from eternity past. We could talk about God's divine perfect will, his, his, his permissive will, his overriding will, but God knows everything. He's the author of everything. So if you can always step back, no matter what's going on, realize, okay, this is part of, God, this is part of God's story for my life right now. This is where I need to be, I guess. There's a challenge, there's a test, something's going on. Even when the attack or stumbling blocks come directly from Satan, it was allowed by God in eternity past. Therefore, there is opportunity. There's always the, what, the, the, the viewpoint of the glass being half full or half empty in a situation. We need to start learning to step back, like I was saying, take a breath, evaluate, discernment. Is the glass half full or half empty? Well, if I'm thirsty, I'm glad it's half full. I'm glad I have it. I'm glad I have some water. Even when the attack or stumbling block comes directly from Satan, it was allowed by God from eternity past. We have to accept that. Therefore, there is a growth opportunity and a glorification opportunity. Challenges, attacks, stumbling blocks, call them what you want, are the Christian's opportunity to apply spiritual combat skills which glorify God and can result in crowns, blessings, and rewards. Folks, we run the race now. You don't run it when you're face to face with the Lord. We run the race now. Opportunities are there to apply spiritual combat skills, which glorify God, can result in crowns, blessings, and rewards. Once you get to heaven, folks, your race has been run. Your race has been run. Right now is the time of action. In fact, 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight, of faith now. Temporal. First Timothy 6 12. Fight the good fight of faith now, royal family. Acts 4 5. On the next day, their rulers, elders, authorities, scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. Acts 4 6. And Ananias, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly descent. So you have all your authority figures there your religious crowd, and Ananias, many of you know about him, the high priest, along with a few others in leadership, were actually known for scams. We see a lot of that in, in churches today, and a lot of that in authority, scams and corruption. Ananias, the high priest, along with a few others in leadership, were actually known for scams, money scams, with not only the money changers in the temple, but actually local gangsters, we would call them. There's a lot of road bandits back in the day, which you would call road bandits. If you were riding your horse or heading down a pathway or a, a heading to another town, you might get robbed. And guess what? Some of those in the Sanhedrin knew about these things and worked behind the scenes skimming money. Money scams with not only money changers in the temple, but local gangs, even road bandits. Backdoor deals from the temple with local Roman officials, centurions, to turn a blind eye. This was not uncommon. I would ask you, is it uncommon today in levels of authority and even sadly some churches, and big churches, very sad state of affairs. But backdoor deals from the temple with local Roman officials, centurions, to turn a blind eye. This was not uncommon. The Sanhedrin was a syndicate, really, of corruption on several levels. Several levels. Think about some of our political class today. We see it, and it fires us up. And then we want to go to the extreme right and overthrow everybody and freak out. we got to find some middle ground and calm down and relax. Think about some of our political class today. Sadly, even some of the clergy within these large denominations and impressive evangelical teachers have many questionable practices behind the scenes. We're not there to judge them. We can evaluate, 
and say, it looks like a pretty dark spirit going on over there. I'm going to separate from that. But think about it. Our political class, even some large denominations, impressive evangelical teachers today have many questionable practices behind the scenes. And I believe, you know, me personally, and I've said this to you guys in recent, if you've been with me, especially since the beginning of the year, I've opened up a lot of things. I think this is 2024 is going to be a year of revealing a lot of things. And I think that's why the Spirit wants us to take a breath, calm down, be prepared to stand strong, and not freak out. Not freak out. The year of revealing. Corruption, perversion at every level of leadership is really nothing new under the sun. For those of you that study the Bible, it's been around forever. You're witnessing some of it right here when I'm telling you about the Sanhedrin. Corruption and perversion at every level of leadership is really nothing new under the sun. Not all, not all, but many are not who they appear to be. I get a kick out of people nowadays that were saying, well, it's all those Democrats who did this. And I, I got news for you. There's a whole bunch of Republicans that are corrupt. So get over yourself because you're dealing with, anybody know what the WWF is? Or what they call it nowadays, WWE? That's all it is, folks. They're in the locker room, you know, Hulk Hogan with Randy Macho Man. Oh, yeah, in the locker room, you're figuring everything out. And then they come forward and tell you all kinds of wonderful things. And they look good on Capitol Hill grilling somebody. And they're going to go after everybody and nothing gets done. They're not in control. It is his story, we know. Corruption and perversion at every level of leadership. Nothing new under the sun. Not all. I don't like to put anybody in a box. Not all, but many are not who they appear to be. It's up to God. He'll sort it all out. And with you, you know what, folks? With your discernment, with your maturity, with that spiritual discernment, you're going to be able to be around a teacher or a situation or a leader or a politician, and just the meter will go up. The BS meter will go up. And you'll be like, okay, I don't belong. I'm going to separate. I'm not going to scream and holler. I'm not going to judge them. I'm going to separate and move, move away. But corruption and perversion at every level has been around. Not all, but many are not who they appear to be. Ananias held power throughout his sons, really, through his family. His sons, his own son-in-law, Caiaphas, his one year as a high priest lasted many, many years. How many names do we have like in Washington, D.C.? I think about it over the years. The same last names. So this one's connected a nephew to that one, this one, that one. His one year, Ananias, as a high priest, lasted many, many years. Same thing we see today in all of our political theaters, really. Generations of power players all connected somehow through bank accounts, business, last names, whatever it is. Acts 4, 7. And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire. By what power and what name have you done this? What the Apostle Peter does next is a classic lesson on standing in truth. This is a classic lesson on standing in truth, remaining steadfast in the face of corrupt leadership. A lot of pressure on him. Acts 4 8. But notice something Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Good lady, filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers and elders of the people. Now notice something. They first and foremost were dead center in the plan of God when, they, when the corrupt leadership came after them. They weren't outside the plan of God. They weren't rebelling. They weren't doing anything wrong. And even under the pressure, they stay, stay in their ground steadfast. Then Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. And this is the Aorist text tells us this was an ongoing practice for the Apostle Peter. It should be an ongoing practice for all of us. The passive voice points to the spirit in control. Filling power is an action we take, yet pay attention. It is the Holy Spirit who does the work. Your new nature, you're opening it up. But you have to turn in your mind. Metanoia we talk about all the time, turning. You adjust to the justice of God. You did it at salvation. You do it throughout your walk. You're constantly adjusting to the justice of God, making sure your fellowship is in order. You're applying the word. Your motivation is right. You're fine. doesn't matter if the attacks come. So the Aris tense tells us this was an ongoing practice for the Apostle Peter. The passive voice points to the Spirit in control. Filling power is an action we take, yet it is the Holy Spirit who does the work. Pimplaini, this verb in the Aris tense and passive voice means to be supplied or influenced. Supplied or influenced to accomplish 
or come to fulfillment. To accomplish or come to fulfillment, we have to allow this, though. We have to allow this, though. Free will matters. I don't teach, I'm not one of those ones we were talking about Calvinist uh, last night a little bit. Free will matters, folks. Started, you see it right in the garden. Free will matters. There would be no angel of conflict, anything without free will. God doesn't make any of us robots before or after salvation. You have to make a conscious decision to realize I need to adjust to the justice of God. I dropped the ball. I missed the target. I don't think I'm applying the word. Let me step back, take a breath, and apply the word. Biblay me, this verb in the aorist tense and passive voice needs to be supplied or influenced to accomplish or come into fulfillment. We have to allow positive volition, God, the Holy Spirit, to fill us. How many times have you heard positive volition in this room, huh? Many of you guys, positive volition, positive volition. Colonel Keene, Pastor Bob, what a great lineage we have. So blessed. Positive volition. You make a free will decision just as you did in salvation, folks. Positive volition toward the word and the justice system of God. He's got it figured out. You don't. He's right. You're wrong. Just kind of give it up to that. He's right. You're wrong. If it doesn't align with the word of God, just figure out. You're wrong. It's okay. Make a quick adjustment. You make your free will decision just as you did in salvation. So positive volition toward the word and the justice system of God. The apostle Peter is not on a personal quest for glory. Pay attention to this. Look at me. I'm going to stand against authority. No. He's, that's not his motivation. You don't get a sense he's filled with the Spirit. It can't be. The Apostle Peter's not on a personal quest for glory, nor is he trying to impress the other apostles. This is a great example of the two power options in action. Filling power of the Spirit and the Word. Two power options in action. Acts 4, 9. He goes on to say, the Apostle Peter goes on to say, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, in other words, what I just did recently, and if is the first class condition in the Greek, because Peter believes this is the reason for his arrest. The Apostle Peter is sticking to the facts. He doesn't have another agenda. All he wants is the truth. All he wants to do is walk in his new nature in, in, the, in the mind of Christ, apply the word of God the right way. He's not trying to make a scene to show off. He's just want to stick with the facts and the truth of Bible doctrine. So if is that Greek first class condition, meaning it's true, because Peter believes this is the reason for the arrest. The apostle Peter sticks to the facts. He's not trying to evade or manipulate the circumstance. This is standing strong without being aggressive. This is standing strong without having to be aggressive. It's not trying to evade or manipulate the circumstance. He doesn't assume anything is corrupt or negative, even though it clearly is. How come, Peter, how come Peter just doesn't yell, you guys are unjust enough, this is wrong what you're doing. He doesn't. He's not trying to evade or manipulate anything. Sticking to the facts, sticking to the truth. He doesn't assume anything is corrupt or negative, even though it clearly is. Everybody was well aware how corrupt and negative the Sanhedrin was. If, and this must be true, this is the reason I was arrested. That was what the Apostle Peter believed. The Apostle Peter references back to the healing he had performed in the temple. He's like, oh, you guys, are, this is what's going on, what I did in the temple? Apostle Peter references back to the healing he had performed in the temple. He doesn't deny, not me, I'm going to wiggle out of this, he doesn't deny or look for wiggle room in anything. Folks, when you're walking in the new nature and you're applying the word, there's a confidence in that that I can't put words to. I can't explain it. It's supernatural. Because I've walked away from situations and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I did that. I know it wasn't me. It was my new nature. It was my Christ-like nature shining. And the doctrine I had in me, I applied it the right way. And all of a sudden I walked away and said, wow, I can't believe I did that. And it was just a calm assurance. It was a confidence in how I handled it. He doesn't deny or look for wiggle room. You don't have to. You don't have to look for any wiggle room, even though the pressure is on. He doesn't deny or look for any wiggle room in anything. If you're, if you're willing to allow God, the Holy Spirit, and the Word to do its work within you, positive volition, if you're willing to allow God, the Holy Spirit, and the Word to do its work within you, this can become a skill set you can apply in very difficult circumstances. 
That's what we want. We want a new skill set. We don't want the skill set we get in the cosmic system and that we used to have. We want a new skill set for all of these situations we're going to face. We're not getting away from them. They're not going anywhere. The tribulation is not going to go away if we get somebody in the White House or this one. And folks, most people would agree, and there's a lot of theologians that will back me up on this, it's hard to find America in the end times. I have my own beliefs on all these things, but we, can, we don't need to go down that road. I've gone down it before. But folks, it doesn't matter if you think this one good person is going to come forward and save everybody. You already had somebody that saved everybody. He's on the cross. How about you hang on to him? Figure out that book. Where's my Bible over there? That book. No, no, it's okay. That book right there. I have all my notes here. That book right there is the mind of Christ. That's all I need. If I'm willing to study it and, and, and learn it and apply it, I'm going to fall on my face here and there. It's okay. My grace is sufficient for you, God tells us. you got plenty of grace. Get up and dust yourself off. Forgive me, Father, I sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep moving. Apply the word. The Apostle Peter is referencing back to something he did, a healing he did. He doesn't deny a look for wiggle room. If you're willing to allow God, the Holy Spirit, the Word to do its work within you, you have to allow it. This can become a skill set you can apply in very, very difficult circumstances. What's an RMA? Anybody know that one? Relaxed mental attitude. What a skill set that one is. Long time coming. I'm half Irish and the other half is French Canadian. No stubbornness there. A relaxed mental attitude. A relaxed mental attitude focused on what? The facts and the word of God. That's all Peter's focused on. He's just focused on the fact, well, I'm an apostle. I'm doing my job. I'm staying in the plan of God. Oh, was there a healing that bothered you? I'm not going to apologize, but I'm not wiggling out of it. I'm assuming that's what's going on here. A relaxed mental attitude focused on the facts, focused on the word of God. Nothing gets blown out of proportion. How many circumstances have we ever been in and, and Rob, I look over, he was a police officer. How quickly does a situation that could be handled, whether it's a speeding ticket or something, get blown out of proportion inside of three minutes of, uh, not even, of, of a couple of heated words and somebody's emotions? Like that. And, and somebody's life changes. Somebody's life changes. Nothing gets blown out of proportion if we do it God's way. Acts 4.10. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified. <laughs> this, this is very bold, this statement, trust me. That by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. The Apostle Peter stands in the power of Christ. All of this, this heat coming down on him Peter stands in the power of Christ, boldly stating truth, gospel, resting in his calling from God and the plan of God. There's no wiggling out of anything because he's in the right. He's in the plan of God. He's in the right. He's walking in the new nature. He's applying the word. He's doing what God called him to do. He's in his little ministry we talked about at the beginning. Nothing wrong with that. Stands in the power of Christ. This is strength. This is strength without having to rebel and take an aggressive action. Standing in the truth of the gospel, resting in his calling from God and the plan of God. God's got it figured out. I'm going to stand here and answer the questions and keep going forward. You get a sense of some divine sarcasm within some statements as well. When you start to, the more you study the Bible, the more you see, especially Paul was really good with divine sarcasm, but you see a lot of little divine sarcasm. It's not meant to like start a big fight, but there's just little things in there like, wake up, the truth is right here. Peter states, the same Jesus who crucifies the one that healed this man through me. Jesus, the one you crucified, is the one who healed the man through me. Acts 4.11. He's the stone which was rejected by you, the builders by which became the chief cornerstone, Psalms 188.22. He's dropping Old Testament doctrine on them. The experts. These are the professors of the law. These are the experts. He's dropping Old Testament doctrine on them. You men are the religious experts. You should know about the Messiah. All kinds of prophecies were fulfilled at the cross of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can't wiggle out of that. 
He's dropping some Old Testament doctrine on them. You men are the religious experts. You should know about the Messiah. Acts 4.12. And there is salvation in no one else. That's a nice little altar call right there. I'm pretty confident everybody in this room is a positive believer, at least what I can evaluate. But maybe somebody out there in video land needs to hear this. There is salvation in no one else. It is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the narrow gate. You have to, there's a reason I wrote that booklet, and actually, Tristan Ty Lee, when you visited me in Florida, you inspired me to write that booklet, The Thief on the Cross. And when I get the next set of copies done, they'll be done, the first page is offset. I apologize, but we got a cheap, we got a really cheap because they offset them. Staples messed up. So I was like, I got a thousand of them, and the first page was offset. And I said, oh, I'm not going to have, oh, okay, Pastor Rick, we'll give you a discount. All right, I can rebound from making a girlfriend. <laughs> But um, the next time I do another batch of those, um, and please take them. I have more at home. I still probably got four or 500 at home. I'll be keep giving them out, giving them out. Those are great evangelist tools. Thief on the Cross was written for a reason, folks. Thief on the Cross was written for a reason as well. Phenomenal example of coming to Christ. There's no works, there's nothing. He recognizes, I'm a sinner, I belong up here, I'm a criminal. Tells the other guy, hey, we belong up here. This is the one. This is the Savior. This salvation in no one else, faith alone in Christ alone. There is no other name under the heavens that has been given among mankind by which we must be saved. There is no other name, none. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God designed you to be exactly who you are, folks, but walking in your new nature, the perfect version of you. The per you want the perfect version of you? Yes, you got to go to the gym, I guess. And yes, you got to eat right. You got to do all these other things we were told to do. But truthfully, the perfect version of you is walking in your new nature habitually. God designed you exactly who you are. He wants to use your personality, your uniqueness. He may shave off some of the rough edges. He may leave some. But God designed you to be exactly who you are. Walking in your new nature is the perfect version of who God made you to be. Get comfortable in that. Get comfortable in that. Allow the Word and God the Holy Spirit to wash over you. What you're doing right now, hopefully, is you're allowing the Word to wash over you. And those gems, those little gemstones of truth, some are going to find spots in your soul. And you're going to be able to polish them and shine them later. Little gemstones. Allow the Word and God the Holy Spirit to wash over you. In time. No rush, folks. Not a 50 meter dash. It's a marathon. In time, you become exactly who God created you to be. There'll, there'll be some bumps and bruises along the way. Welcome to the human race. In time, you become exactly who God created you to be. Not a phony, not a cookie cut out Christian. The Christ like version of you was not designed to be fake or forced. Not designed to be faked or forced. It is the mind of Christ operational in your day-to-day -day life, folks. You grab a drink. Am I sounding okay out there so far? Yeah? Yeah, yeah good back there, Jimmy? Okay, cool. I noticed you looked at the recorder. Was everything all right? It's good? All right. Just keeping me on my toes, brother. Right. Yes, sir. I like that. The Christ-like nature... That version of you was not designed to be faked or forced. In fact, every time you try to fake and force something in the plan of God, you're in your, you're either in your old nature or new nature. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. So then you're just doing like a works program. The Christ-like version of you was not designed to be faked or forced. It is the mind of Christ operational in your day-to-day -day life. Operational. It means you're doing something. A lot of people like to, to maybe read scriptures or study the Bible occasionally, but are they operational? Are they walking out there applying things? This, this example of Peter standing there, this kind of pressure he's under, and he comes right out with the gospel and throws it back. Yeah, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one you guys are experts about, that you, that, that you hung on the cross, he's the one that works through me, healing people. Standing in front of those who can condemn him. The authority. So the Christ-like version of you is not designed to be faked, forced, or a cookie cutter. It is the mind of Christ operational in your day-to-day -day life. If you stay true to this statement, you'll stand boldly in any circumstance. 
If you stand true to this statement, you'll stand boldly in every, in every circumstance and you'll keep growing and get better discernment, more maturity, a more relaxed mental attitude over time. Again, it's a marathon. It's not a 50 meter dash, folks. We all become a new creature in Christ at salvation. But then we learn to grow in it. We learn to apply it. We get closer and closer to Christ. He must what? Increase. We must decrease. So we all become a new creature in Christ. The moment of salvation is actually 40. From my lineage, this, the, the men that taught in my lineage, which were some great men of God, taught there was about 40 grace gifts that we can probably track. 40 grace gifts that happen like that at the moment of salvation. It means in this temporal walk, the power and slavery under the old sin nature no longer, your choice, no longer has to run your life. Your choice. God's a perfect gentleman. It means in this temporal walk, the power and slavery under the old sin nature no longer has to run your life. It doesn't have to call the shots in your life. It's up to you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Apostle Paul, he's really, in the church age, he's kind of our guy. You know, Paul's kind of our go-to guy in the church age. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creature, matter of fact. New creature, new creation. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Choice is yours. Do you want to apply those new things? The more you live in this truth, the stronger you will become. The more you live in this truth, the stronger you will become. Again, God's a perfect gentleman. You have to make choices. What you do, many of you today made a choice to say, you know what, I'm going to go hang out for the weekend with the royal family, do some face-to-face. -face. It's a little more exciting than online. But I believe in the conversations we've had recently with a lot of folks, I think everything is so internet bound and I'm, I'm, I've got people, I have a group, small group in Africa that are following me now. I got folks in Australia. It's, it's wild, you know what I mean? To realize I just, I get on these platforms, YouTube and Rumble and Facebook and I throw these videos out there and I just keep doing them. And all of a sudden I'm getting emails from people in these other countries like, really like that message and I like the fact your notes go on your Facebook page. All my raw notes, Rob's going to show you today when we come back from our lunch break later on. He's going to do a little presentation. He's done a phenomenal job on the website. All my raw notes go on there, mistakes and all. And you'll see my, um, my uh, how I sound the words out in the Greek and the Hebrew. I do it my own way. So if I was to say agape, I would put A-H dash GOP, G-U-P, A. Just in big letters on the, if I didn't know how to pronounce because that gets me through. I know my weak areas. I'm not trying to be anything I'm not. I'm comfortable who God made me to be. But all of that stuff goes in my raw notes. And it actually helps. This, guy, this gentleman, Benjamin, in, in, in Zimbabwe has a soccer school. They call me Pastor Chili Sweet or Sweet Chili. <laughs> yeah, he sent me a while and he sent me an IM. He said, because he said, you're rough sometimes. He goes, but well, we like it. It's sweet. It's the truth. I said, oh, okay. I kind of like that. I said, that about fits. Yeah. <laughs> I am a little rough around the edges. I said, that's right. Anyhow, the more you live in this truth, royal family, right here, Apostle Paul, the more you live in this truth, the stronger you're going to become. And it's a journey. Acts 4, 13. Look at verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence, calm assurance, confidence of who? Peter and John. And understood that they were uneducated, untrained men. They were amazed. And began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. These two guys were local fishermen. They actually, I believe, I'm trying to think which set of brothers it was, had pretty fairly successful uh, fishing in, in the fishing industry. But it was they were fishermen. They weren't scholars. So these two guys were local fishermen. Their families had been in the fishing industry, and the, these were common working men by any other standard. And isn't it interesting? I, I always think it is. The men God often chooses for leadership roles in the ministry. I, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, 28, I really enjoy those. I, I feel very comfortable inside 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28. Not many mighty, not many wise. God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, the base, the low things. It's always been a very comfortable scripture for me. They're not who the majority would pick. If you would, and, and anybody would be lying to me if you told me different, if you lived in, the, in you know, 2,000 years ago, 
and Jesus came up to you and was saying, I gotta pick some apostles. You'd say, Well, let's go over to the temple because the scholars over there, those Sanhedrin, those guys, the scribes, Sadducees, and Pastors, they'll make some great apostles. And he's like, No, let's go by the down, down by the, the, the river road, let's go by the water over there, look at some fishermen, let's go to the construction site, look at the construction workers. Most of us would be like, Oh no, no, Lord, you want the scholars. They're not who the majority would pick. Acts 4.13. Be careful how we put God in a box. I always say that in my, all my messages. I have to be careful. You have to be careful. Acts 4.13. Now as they observed the confidence, calm assurance of Peter and John, a joyful boldness, it's called confidence, a joyful boldness, a relaxed yet confident stance. Parousia. Parousia. A joyful boldness, a relaxed yet confident stance, speaking openly, with a strength of conviction, not arrogance, not rebellious, a strength of conviction, because you know it's the Word of God. If truth is singular and you're standing in the Word of God filled with the Spirit, applying His Word, you got the truth behind you. It's the only truth. Parasia really speaks to a calm assurance, a RMA, a relaxed mental attitude. That's a version of it, relaxed mental attitude, a calm assurance. A strength of convic conviction, a joyful boldness, relaxed yet confident. There's a difference between cocky and confident. I think we all know that, right? Somebody that pounds their chest and then they can't back it up or they act a fool thinking they know everything and then two days later you're like, this guy didn't know anything. A relaxed yet confident stance speaking openly and with a strength of conviction. Parousia really speaks to a relaxed mental attitude, a calm assurance. This takes what? Bible doctrine resident in the soul. I know a lot of these sayings go back way before I was ever ordained by a lot of great men before me, but I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. Bible doctrine resident in the soul. Best way you can put it, best way you can look at it. Is Bible doctrine resident in your soul? It has to be absorbed all the time. It's got to be habitual. When we get away from it for long periods of time, folks, you'd be surprised how quickly you forget to apply and learn and things slip away. Bible doctrine resident in the soul, circulating. There's an American biblical scholar, Kenneth Wuss, many of you know, put it like this about Acts 4.13. <clears throat> and viewing with a practiced eye the free and fearless confidence free and fearless confidence of Peter and John as manifested in their uninhibited, uninhibited and unreserved manner of speaking. They're uninhibited because they're confident. They have a calm assurance. Unreserved manner. They're not going to like wiggle or hold or do it. They're standing in the word. They're applying the word. They don't have to reserve anything. Unreserved manner of speaking and comprehending the fact that they were without formal education and that they were not professional men by that standard of the Sanhedrin, obviously, but laymen. They began to wonder and kept on wondering. And they began to recognize them who were with Jesus. That's from Kenneth Woods, 1941. He was, his specialty was actually Greek New Testament studies. And this is a great interpretation of exactly, really, what Acts 4.13 points out. It's a great way to look what Acts 4.13 points out. Those who were with Jesus, because even though they had their own mannerisms and personalities, they did just like you do, they had the mind of Christ. They had their own mannerisms, they had their own personalities, yet the mind of Christ. When we talk about fellowship and, and the conversations we've had recently, and uh, uh, you know, Deacon Jimmy and I had conversations here when we first got here about fellowship, and then some other folks, I think Rob, and I forgot who else I had a conversation with, it's the reason you all of a sudden can meet a, a really good student, a serious student of the accuracy of the word, and almost immediately have this flow, this fellowship. You're still who you are. You're not trying to fake and be, I have to be exactly like Jesus. He'll flow through you. He'll use your personality. Trust me when I tell you. These who were with Jesus, because even though they had their own mannerisms, Peter and John, different personalities, they all 12 had different personalities. I did a study one time and. I think about four or five years back, I think it was during the Matthew series that I was in, about uh, little quirks and the personalities that you can find through research. All different, all 12 of them different. Those who were with Jesus, because even though they had their own mannerisms, their own quirks, their own personalities, they had the mind of Christ front and center. 
And that what wakes everybody up. They're like, these are followers of Jesus. Now, there are some also in the Sanhedrin that had done business with John's family, I believe it was. But they knew just by them speaking and the things they were saying, the mind of Christ front and center. They reflected the teaching and the words of Jesus Christ. They reflect the teaching and the words of Jesus Christ. The leaders of the Sanhedrin recognize their faces because the mind of Christ probably, for some of them, sparked a memory of Jesus teaching to the public. And they're like, oh, they sound just like this Jesus guy. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah, because they're in their new nature. They're applying his mind, his word. Spark the memory of Jesus teaching publicly. Just as people can see Christ reflected in your lifestyle. Just as people can see Christ reflected in your lifestyle and stand the way you stand and make the truth apparent in your life. How you stand, the choices you make, your lifestyle, you can reflect Christ. There's people that will walk away from you sometimes when you apply doctrine in the new nature and they're going to like, wow, this guy, this girl, they got so much wisdom. It's Christ. You're reflecting Jesus Christ. People can see Jesus Christ reflected in your lifestyle and the stand that you make in truth when you stand in something and believe something. Acts 4.14 And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. Notice the Apostle Peter and John shut them down with rebellion? No. Apostle Peter and John shut them down with arrogance? No. Apostle Peter and John shut them down with anger? Manipulation? No. They shut them down with Bible doctrine. They shut them down with Bible doctrine. The authorities, they stood their ground, they stood strong, no wiggle room, no manipulation. They used the Word of God, they applied the Word of God, and they let the chips fall where they might. Let the chips fall where they may. Apostle Peter and, and John shut them down with Bible doctrine. Acts 4.15. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another. Oh, guys, we're in trouble. How do we handle these guys? All the scholars got to come together. We're nervous now. These fishermen got us nervous. They ordered them to leave the council. They began to confer with one another. We got a problem. What's the problem? The truth. Can't get around it. What I always tell you guys, a lie goes around the world twice or three times before the truth even gets out of bed to put its pants on, but it'll get around. And the truth will roll over everything eventually in the end. The truth will roll over everything. And it's certainly here, the truth of the word of God, the reflection of Christ was actually rolling over the corrupt leadership. It wasn't because Peter and John wanted to rebel or hurt anybody. They didn't want to cause any issues. They wanted to do what God called them to do. Stand in the truth. And the truth was rolling over these guys. They don't know how to handle it. They have to have a meeting now. Got to bring together all the wise men. Acts 4, 16, saying, what do we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place, can't get around that one. Through them, this is very apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. How do we cover this one up, guys? How do we cover up the latest scandal? in Washington, D.C.? How do we cover up the latest lie with this company or that company? How are we going to cover up this? How are we going to take the truth and skew it a little bit? They can't. The truth was steamrolling right over. What are we going to do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them, it's very apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, uh-oh, our authority's in trouble. That's what they're worried about. In the end, that's what this is worried about. It's called power lust and approbation lust. Many of you understand that. Their seat of authority, their luxury life, whatever it was they had that they thought that was their great power is being shaken. The fishbowl is being shaken. What is the uh, the snow things? You said? Snow globes. The snow globes. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> it's good to finally meet you. See you online. Thank you. It's a nice to nice. There's a face. Come on, face. I'm like, ah, that's who you are. You see, uh, you instant message me on Facebook and all that. It's, like, it's a necessary evil, folks. we got to have it. We have to have it, unfortunately, to get the word out there. But there's a wonderful woman of God right over there. Awesome to meet you. But you notice how powerful the truth is. It steamrolls over everything. Notice how powerful the truth is. There's absolutely nothing wrong with speaking truth to power. 
There's absolutely nothing wrong with speaking truth to power, obviously, especially corrupt power. There's nothing wrong with that. God doesn't want you to be this little afraid mouse in the corner. Everybody, every time somebody in authority comes forward, he wants you to respect that chain of command and handle it the right way. But if there's lies and corruptions coming at you and you realize it, or there's somebody around you or somebody innocent being struck by that corruption and wickedness, it's okay for you to stand up and say, excuse me, I, I have a question about this. This doesn't appear right. And speak the truth. There's nothing wrong with that, but you notice how powerful truth is. There's absolutely nothing wrong with speaking truth to power, especially corrupt power. Because you have what the Apostle Paul here says, Romans 8, 3. What then shall we say to these things? If God for us, who against us, he said. If God for us, who against us? God does not fellowship, royal family, with sin or evil. You know that. Therefore, boldly standing in truth while in your new nature, this is the key, boldly standing in truth while in your new nature will never put you outside the plan of God. At no time what we just looked at was Peter or John outside the plan of God. Not before the Sanhedrin came upon him and the Sadducees were trying to drag him in front of the council and all this stuff. Not before, not in the middle, not afterwards. They were never outside the plan of God. If you're in your new nature, it's never going to put you outside the plan of God. There's an incredible strength when you are in your new nature applying God's word and it appears the odds are against you. And I'm here to tell you, from what I can see on the landscape in the year of our Lord, 2024, I think there's going to be, a, I think, like I said recently, there's probably going to be some kind of revival. It looks like it's happening. That can go in any direction. That can, that can spark off craziness. It could spark off good things. Who knows? But Christians and good, accurate, bible study Christians, I can see are going to come under attack because there's going to be a lot of counterfeits like I've been teaching recently and a lot of lies cropping up because... For this one world system to come to fruition in the tribulation, the foundational piece has got to be there. And the last piece I keep telling you all is that one world religious system. Now, it may happen overnight, right after the rapture, quickly. I, my personal, my First Amendment right, YouTube, my personal belief is the foundation is being laid for all these things. I brought up some things at the last conference in, in Florida uh, about the three Abrahamic fates coming together and how... Uh, our Jesuit friend over there went and already preached at the, uh, the temples. Anyway, um, I just see the foundation being built, and I don't think Christians, good Bible studying, accurately handling the word Christians, are going to be able to escape some heat coming their way. So we got to be strong. we got to be ready to stand up and say, well, I think that's wrong. If you're polite, you're doing things the right way in the new nature, it's okay to say, I think that thing's wrong. I'm not, I'm not with that. That doesn't seem to be part of the plan of God. But if you're in your new nature, you're not going to be outside the plan of God. So relax. There's an incredible strength when you are in your new nature, applying God's word, and it appears the odds are against you. An incredible strength. strength. But it always comes down to, folks, you're going to hear this a lot this weekend, the right thing done in the right way. The man who ordained me, Pastor Bob, Grace Bible Church, Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries used to say that all the time, and it's a fact of life. The right thing done in the right way matters. But there is incredible strength when you're in your new nature, you're standing strong in your nature, your new nature, applying God's word, and it appears the odds are against you. The struggle most Christians have, and we all fall, the struggle most Christians have is allowing their emotions to get the best of them. This is a good example of that not happening with Peter and John. The struggle most Christians have is allowing their emotions to get the best of them. We all do it from time to time, relax. Dust yourself off, take a step back, take that breath, rebound, do what you need to do, get back in the plan of God. But we all struggle with this. Emotions getting the best of us, folks. And we all do it from time to time. This example of Peter and John under pressure from wicked authority and that's what it was, corrupt authority, is really a tremendous lesson for us. It's one of the first ones I wanted to highlight. We're going to go over several. We're going to get into the New Testament. I'm going to show you some things. Many of you know about Daniel, uh, obviously, and, and his friends having to, to make a stand against the king, a corrupt king. We're going to look at Rahab. People don't realize that this, how she had to stand and do something 
that was against really treasonous to her kingdom as she looked at it. We're going to look at Jonathan and David. Jonathan had a father and a king as an authority over him. And he didn't always follow the way of the king and the father. But the struggle most Christians have is they let their emotions get ahead of them. This example of Peter and John under pressure from wicked authorities is a tremendous lesson for all of us how to deal with this. Acts 4.17. <clears throat> Acts 4.17. Let me grab it right here. But so <clears throat> that it will not spread any further among the people... Let's warn them not to speak any longer to any person in this name. Yeah, that's going to happen. They're apostles. They're directly in the center. They're doing exactly what Jesus said, go and do. And these guys say, well, we'll tell them not to do that anymore. We're oh so powerful. Keep in mind, this is the high council. Keep in mind, this is the high council, not only the religious law, you have, many of you understand this, at the time, uh, the, the, Jews, the Jews were in power here, and the Roman authority was over them. But this, keep in mind, this is the high council, not only the religious law and order, but the legal committee the Jews answered to within their community, really. The Romans didn't want to deal with, as long as you were paying your taxes, they could tax the heck out of you and keep their thumb on you. They, you guys do your thing. Answer to your Jewish council. You do, don't bring it to me. You know, they don't bring it over to me. That, that's Rome, Rome wanted. I, want, I need my money. I need you to be very uh, docile towards us, and you can do your little thing over there. So keep in mind, this is the high council, not only the religious law and order, but the legal committee the Jews answer to within their own community. At this historic point, it was Roman rulership and Sanhedrin who dictated the laws. And let's face it, the Sanhedrin was going to get their way with the Roman rulership. They always did, because they don't want the people uprising. They said they, the Sanhedrin was, in, in, on some level, many of them were in bed with Roman uh, political leaders as well. These men were religious zealots, legalists. It's a definition of it. Legalists, religious zealots. Everything that they stood for was based on the Mosaic law as well as additions. A lot of people lose sight of this from the Talmud. Hundreds and hundreds of things they added in. These men were religious zealots, legalists. Everything they stood for was based on the Mosaic law. Now if they did it the right way, they'd be different. They didn't do the right thing in the right way as well as additions from the Talmud. It was their own unbelief and arrogance that pushed them into thinking Jesus Christ had disregarded the Mosaic Law. That's what, they were, that's what they were trying to preach and teach when Christ was going around saying, I'm here to help and heal everyone. I'm here for the lost sheep of Israel. Here's your last chance, folks. Come to me, Israel. It was their own unbelief and arrogance that pushed them into thinking Jesus Christ had disregarded the Mosaic law. Yet in true Christianity, if you understand true Christianity, when we are walking in the new nature, how often do I tell you guys this? We fulfill every command or standard, including the Mosaic law. People get all up in arms about legalistic people get all up in arms about the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic law, you got to follow everything, blah, blah, blah. Are you in your new nature? Relax, take a breath. Are you in your new nature? Are you applying the word of God? You're fulfilling everything you need to do. You're in union with Christ. You're applying his mind. You're fulfilling everything you need to do. Folks, we live in the church age. Things have changed. As things have progressed. The, the completed canon of scripture is done. If you are walking in the new nature, your Christ-like nature, doing what these gentlemen were doing, Peter and John, and applying the word of God, you're fulfilling everything. Don't let some religious zealot say, well, you still need to do this, you still need to do it. Listen, I'm applying the word of God, I'm filled with the, I'm filled with the spirit. I'm reflecting Christ-like nature. You are walking in your new nature where you fulfill every command or standard, including the Mosaic law. Jesus Christ came to not unnecessarily abolish, as some people teach, to fulfill. He fulfilled everything. And when that veil in the temple was ripped, that's it. It opened up. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the commands and laws. All we need to do is walk in our Christ-like nature. We are fulfilling our calling. The day that we live in historical context matters. We are fulfilling our calling under God's grace plan. Jesus Christ came to fulfill everything. He either did or he didn't. As far as I know, he didn't get anything wrong. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the commands and laws. 
All we need to do is walk in our Christ-like nature and we fulfill our calling under God's plan. Legalists hate that. Legalists and legalisms, legalistic people hate that. Matthew 5, 17. Do not presume that I came to abolish the law, not my words or the prophets. I didn't. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. It's all done in me. It's had a last night. It is finished. It is done. These men were really the apex, the peak of religion at this time. They represented a system of works as you've never seen before. Incredible. Hundreds of things they added in. Hundreds. These men were the apex of religion at the time. Religious, legalistic type of people. They represented a system of works as you have never seen before, folks. They were working for salvation as well as working for rituals and programs towards spirituality. You have to do this. You need to do this right. What day is this? Did you apply that? Did you do this? It's exhausting. It's exhausting. They were working for salvation as well as working their rituals and programs towards spirituality. More spiritual than everybody else. They knew Jesus Christ stood for everything that was a, that they were that they opposed their corrupt system. Everything he didn't say shined a light on their corrupt system. Big problem for them. Everything Jesus Christ did or said now, because now they got to deal with the apostles, and now this thing, this these people of the way it was called at first, are starting to really grow. They're starting to go across the landscape, and they're still shining that light on our corruption. That light of truth is still shining on our corruption. They knew that Jesus Christ stood for everything that was opposed to their corrupt system. And now here they have Jesus' men carrying on the tradition. And because they understood that, they wanted to stop it right there and then. There's a lot of frustration in these scriptures when you look at the Sanhedrin and what was going on. They thought they were done with that Jesus thing. Yeah, the body, we can't find the body, but he's lost, but then all of a sudden he shows up and walks around. Now you have all these thousands of witnesses, hundreds of thousands of witnesses around speaking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now he's finally gone, and now these guys come around. Now they're going to be all over the landscape. They can't win. They're not designed to win. God wins. They knew that Jesus Christ stood for everything that was opposed to their corruption, and because they understood this, his men, they wanted to stop them right there and then. Acts 4.18 Acts 4.18. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Their whole calling, their whole spiritual walk is to go out to a lost and dying world and proclaim Christ and develop the early church. They're going to stop all of that for the Sanhedrin. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Acts 4.19, here we go. But Peter and John answered to them, okay, sorry, I don't want to be in trouble. You guys are right, I'm wrong. Peter and John answered them and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, make your own judgment, gentlemen. Acts 4.20, we cannot. We cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Even though the authority of the land is going to come crushing down on us in a lot of ways, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen, what we have heard. This is quite the predicament. Quite the predicament when the Christian understands the doctrine of authority. We're going to touch on it a little bit, but it's now faced with this dilemma. But am I showing you the right thing done in the right way? I hope so. You didn't see Peter and John rebel. There was no violence. There was no threats. There was just, I'm going to stand in the truth and speak the truth. And you guys do with it what you want. It's up to God. God will make his own judgment. He's kind of got this figured out. But we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. Quite the predicament they're in where the Christian understands the doctrine of authority, but is now faced with this dilemma. The answer Peter and John gave was incredibly confident. Like again, it wasn't volatile, it wasn't designed to be political, didn't have an agenda behind it other than truth. The answer Peter and John gave was incredibly confident, also defiant. Defiant. What they said was not that they purposely tried to be defiant, 
But the truth will go forward. If there's corruption and lies and counterfeits, the truth is going to be defiant to that in some form or fashion. The answer Peter and John gave was incredibly confident, also defiant to the leadership of the land, yet it was not disrespectful or overly aggressive. None of it that I showed you. We got about five minutes for a break? Yeah. Okay. Yet it was not disrespectful or overly aggressive. How they handled this was not disrespectful or overly aggressive. I can't stress that enough in this series. We're going to be taking a break in a few minutes, but I'm going to harp on some things over and over again about the right thing done in the right way. It's very important where the Spirit's leading me and where we're going, at, certainly here in America, where we're, I think as a world, but the, the country that, that I live in, that I see around us, I just want you guys to know when the attacks come, it's okay to stand in truth, but please do it the right way. Please do it the right way. The answer Peter and John gave was incredibly confident and also defiant to the leadership in the land, yet it was not disrespectful, it was not overly aggressive, they were not outside the plan of God. That's all you need to worry about. Am I outside the plan of God? If you are, adjust to the justice of God. Get yourself back in line. Because they were not walking in their flesh. The example I'm showing you in Acts 4, they're not walking in their flesh. Because they're not walking in their flesh, but instead the new nature and applying God's word. They're showing they've got some wisdom. We talk about, many of you know, gnosis and epinosis. Epinosis is where you want to be because that's like that's like having the tools and learning but then all of a sudden you can take the tools and learn and then all of a sudden you can do it and you understand it and you really could actually teach others or you can fulfill something you don't just understand the basics and a couple of tools in your hand you can get your hands dirty and get in there and do it gnosis and epinosis because they're not walking in their flesh but instead in their new nature applying God's word this is not a flare up of temper here there's no flare-up of temper or purposeful challenge to authority. This is to stand in the truth. Even during the heat of battle, when your emotions are responding, royal family, in proper fashion, because emotions can respond, they should respond. It is possible to stand in truth and forge forward without allowing your temper to get the best of you. It's possible to stand in truth even when the emotions are bubbling, because emotions respond. They have to respond in the right way. That's the issue. We have to learn how to bridle and harness our emotions. I think we're going to take a little bit of break for about 20 or 30 minutes stretch, get some coffee. Everybody good? Thank you for your patience. Bye.